When a movie revolves around a serial killer, a monster, or a supernatural force, there's a lot of fear in the air. But stories like this also sow a huge amount of mistrust. Not only do the characters not know who to trust, neither do the viewers. While watching a horror flick, especially a slasher, we're always eager to accuse the weirdo of being up to no good, even if they probably wouldn't hurt a fly. We become so laser-focused on these red herrings that we don't notice the real villain until it's too late. So let's take a look at these outcasts in a little more detail today. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 horror movie characters you didn't trust, even though you probably should have. Number 10. Buddy, The Gift the gift centers around a clairvoyant called Annie. Interestingly enough, she was actually based on Billy Bob Thornton's mother. When Principal Wayne Collins' fiancé Jess goes missing, Annie becomes convinced that Jess has been murdered after seeing her corpse in a vision. Even though all signs point to a violent deadbeat called Donnie being the murderer, we never buy it for a second. Instead, our money is on Buddy Cole. As soon as he's introduced, it's clear that Buddy is a deeply disturbed individual. One moment he's trying to attack somebody with a crowbar, the next he's screaming at a gunman to shoot his head off. And to top it all off, we see Buddy try to kill someone during one of Annie's premonitions. At this point, it would be crazy to suggest anyone except Buddy was the culprit. But during the climax, Wayne reveals to Annie that he was the one who murdered Jess after discovering that she was sleeping with Donnie. Just as he's about to kill Annie, Buddy appears out of nowhere and knocks Wayne out. Only then does Annie realize that she had misinterpreted her premonition. Number 9. Warren. What Lies Beneath in What Lies Beneath, Claire spots her neighbor Mary crying hysterically and blubbering about her husband Warren. When she becomes noticeably agitated when she sees her husband, Claire suspects Mary is trapped in an abusive marriage. After Mary goes missing, Claire's concern for her intensifies. When Claire questions Warren about his wife's whereabouts, he's noticeably terse with her before suddenly leaving. When Claire starts having visions of a dead woman, she's 100% adamant that Warren killed his wife. But when she publicly accuses Warren, Claire is humiliated to see Mary stand standing beside him, healthy and very, very alive. Over time, we learn the visions that she had were of a different woman who Claire misidentified as Mary. Although horror fans are always wary of misdirection, this is one we all fell for. Whilst most horror movies set up a red herring for 5 or 10 minutes, What Lies Beneath spends nearly half its runtime on this subplot. Because Claire dissects her neighbor's habits and relationship for a good 40 minutes, we assume that there's some truth to her hypothesis. As it turns out, though, the whole situation was one huge red herring. Number 8. Rex, My Little Eye in My Little Eye, five individuals take part in a reality show where they must stay in an isolated mansion for six months in order to win $1 million. After spending so much time with one another, tension rises between the participants, mainly because of Rex. Time and time again, this guy goes out of his way to get on everyone's last nerve. He obnoxiously winds up Matt when he learns that he has feelings for another contestant. When Danny receives a letter that states his grandfather died, Rex shows zero sympathy and tells the others to keep their eyes on the prize. And when he looks into the camera and said he pities the audience, you just want to punch him in the bloody face. Although Rex takes the gold in the jerk Olympics, he's not actually a malicious person. In fact, he's the one who discovers the contest isn't actually real and that the group are unknowingly taking part in a snuff film. Sadly, Rex's hard work fails to pay off since all the contestants are killed off immediately after. Nevertheless, you feel like Rex finally redeemed himself since he was practical and considerate when he realized that the group was actually in danger. Number 7. Cotton. Scream 2. Now let's be honest, nobody correctly guessed the identity of Scream's big bad ghost face. Horror fans didn't want to be caught out for a second time, so we were extra attentive while watching Scream 2. And yet the sequel pulled a fast one on us once more. For the majority of the runtime, many would bet good money that Ghostface was none other than Cotton, since he had a genuine motive. After all, he was unfairly imprisoned after Sydney pinned her mother's rape and murder on him. Although he was cleared when the real murderer was found, you can understand why Cotton was out to get Sydney, since her testimony nearly destroyed destroyed his life. Now I know what you're thinking, Cotton couldn't be the villain because it's far too obvious, right? But that's exactly what happened in the last movie. Because everyone in Woodsboro thought that Billy was Ghostface, including Sydney, we assumed his purpose in the story was to throw us off the real killer's trail. When Billy revealed that he was indeed the one behind the mask, we were absolutely gobsmacked. Even though the baddie in a slasher is usually the last person you'd suspect, many thought that Scream 2 would go against the mold again. And here not only was Cotton innocent, but he saved Sydney from Ghostface during the climax. Number 6. David Worth, Cube 
In Cube, six people awaken inside a colossal maze that's filled with lethal booby traps. After they get their bearings, they all try to work together to escape, save for one worthless malcontent, ironically called Worth. Worth appears to be completely uninterested in the team's plans and regularly disregards their decisions. When he refuses to elaborate on his backstory, they start to suspect that he's responsible for their predicament, especially Quentin. After Worth blurts out, there's no way out of here, during a heated argument, it seemingly validates Quentin's notion. And when he confesses, that he designed the outer shell of the labyrinth, well, it looks like the jig is up. But very quickly, we realize that Worth is as much a victim as anyone else, since he was placed in the cube-shaped prison by his spiteful superiors. Not only that, he had no idea what the maze was being built for. The only reason he didn't want to escape is because he was ashamed of the evil that he unknowingly committed. Sadly, things take a dark turn shortly after Worth's revelation. As the isolation and starvation takes its toll on Quentin, he snaps and starts killing the others. Even though Quentin seemed like the most stable of the lot, he was the one that the group should have been the most wary of. Number 5. The Pasty-Faced Man – Body Bags Body Bags opens with a psychology student, Anne, preparing for her first all-night shift at a filling station. As Anne sets up shop, her co-worker warns her to keep her eyes open since a killer has escaped from a nearby mental institution. Although Anne deals with various eccentric customers, the pasty-faced man portrayed by visionary director Wes Craven stands out the most for all the wrong reasons. Because of his unkempt hair, disheveled suit, drunken stupor, droopy eyes, and leering smile, any rational person would be on high alert in his presence. When he beckons for Anne to step out of her booth, you feel like the only way this crackpot could act more suspicious if he was literally a red flag. Even though Anne interacts with a few other passers-by, you're expecting the pasty-faced man to return at any moment to slit her throat. But he never does. In fact, we never see this guy again. Despite only appearing for a minute in the entire movie, you're ready to bet all your chips that this is the guy that you have to watch out for. Number 4. Tony Devil in Devil, five strangers find themselves trapped inside an elevator. Just when they think that their situation couldn't get any worse, they discover that the devil himself is amongst them, which is definitely the last thing that you'd want. Well, that and somebody to let one go. When he starts killing them one by one, the survivors try to deduce which of them is the Prince of Darkness. Straight away, Logan Marshall Green's character Tony is suspect number one. He acts like a jerk off the bat, talks in a cryptic manner, and acts aggressively to everyone else. And on top of that, we don't learn his name until the very end. Now, unless Devil is your first horror movie, you'll assume that Tony is a red herring at first. It's so blatantly obvious that he's the bad guy that there's no way that he can be. I mean, the movie can't be that predictable, can it? But after Satan kills everyone but Tony and the other occupant, Sarah, your suspicion of him increases tenfold. Because we've already seen Sarah's backstory, we know that she's not the devil, so who else is it going to be? In the final moments, we learn that the devil was actually Jane, the elderly woman in the elevator, who was seemingly killed earlier. Because viewers wouldn't suspect somebody who was apparently dead, Tony was the the only one giving out bad vibes and not Jane. Number 3. Michael McDonald and the Weird Janitor – Urban Legend in Urban Legends opening scene, a young woman called Michelle stops at a gas station which is managed by a stuttering, gangly eccentric sort called Michael McDonald. When he tries to lock Michelle in his office, she suspects that he's a lunatic and starts to freak out. But as she gets into the back of her car and drives off, Michael yells, someone's in the back seat. But unable to hear Michael's warning, the Parker-wearing serial killer in Michelle's car decapitates her. Not only is this a rather solid way to kick off the story, it warns us not to judge a book by its cover. And yet, anyone who wants watches Urban Legend presumes that the janitor is the killer simply because he kind of looks odd. Having said that, you have to go against every instinct not to suspect this guy. Because of his skeletal appearance and bulging eyes, he looks like a textbook psychopath. Also, he owns the same Parker as the killer, and on top of that, he's literally credited as Weird Janitor. And when you discover Weird Janitor isn't actually the perp, you actually feel embarrassed that you fell for the film's misdirection not once, but twice. Number 2. Bishop – Aliens Aliens opens with Ripley being transported to a Wayland yutani spaceship. While sitting at the canteen, she notices a technician called Bishop performing a knife trick, aka five-finger fillet, to the privates. At first, Ripley assumes that this guy is just a bit of a loose cannon, but when Bishop reveals that he's a synthetic android, Ripley goes ballistic. Even though nobody else is bothered by Bishop, Ripley's concerns are pretty warranted. While Ripley was stationed aboard the Nostromo, her co-worker Ash, who was secretly a robot planted by the Wayland yutani Corporation, jeopardized the mission, which led to the death 
death of the crew. So understandably, this incident left Ripley with a deep-rooted mistrust for artificial life forms. Bishop attempts to soothe her, claiming Ash's model was a twitchy. Furthermore, Bishop is programmed so it's impossible for him to harm a human. Nevertheless, Ripley keeps acting like Bishop is a bomb ready to go off. Another reason why viewers get squirrely any time that Bishop is on screen is simply because the actor portraying him, Lance Henriksen, is effortlessly creepy. Interestingly, Henriksen intended to portray the character while wearing double pupil contact lenses to appear even more unnerving, but director James Cameron told him he didn't need the lenses since Henriksen already looked plenty creepy enough. I guess that's a compliment. <laughs> and number one, Keith, Barbarian. There are a few horror films in recent memory that pulled off misdirection as effectively as Barbarian. This nerve-wracking thriller opens with Tess arriving at a rental house, only to learn that it's occupied by a stranger called Keith. This dilemma is terrifying, since Tess is in a dangerous neighborhood at night with nowhere else to go. When Keith validates that he legally paid for his accommodation, Tess is still on edge, purely because of the rather peculiar circumstances. But what makes Keith so creepy is the fact that he tries not to be creepy. When he emphasizes that he didn't spike Tess's drink unprompted, you can't help but think that that's exactly what he did. All of his attempts to reassure her come across as forced and disingenuous. Even when she eventually lets her guard down, viewers are certain that this guy is bad news. Unfortunately, we don't know how wrong we are until it's too late. When Tess discovers a secret room in the basement, she becomes hysterical. Keith laughs it off and, just as a side note, don't ever do that in a horror movie, and inspects the room to prove that there's no threat. When Keith doesn't return, you can't help but think that this is all part of his master plan. But we find out later that he's been murdered by the house's other secret resident, and then we realize that Keith wasn't actually the true monster here. Sorry, Keith, we kind of misjudged you, but at the same time, you were a bit creepy, mate. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 horror movie characters you didn't trust, even though you should have. Hope you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Instagram, where it's at RetroJ, but the O is a zero. Hope to see you over there, my friends, and come check out all the Warhammer miniatures that I've been painting. Yes, I am a nerd. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Because there is one thing in life that you can trust, and that is that you, my friend, listening to this video are a massive ledge. You deserve all the best things in life, like love, happiness, and success. We all do as human beings, and I want you to go out there and smash your life goals today, because I bloody believe in you, alright? As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.